Well, I am excited to speak to you this morning. I've got a word on my heart. Um, you know, Pastor Jim's been talking about prayer lately, and I've been thinking about that. Um, you know, what I wanted to talk about is identity, understanding who you are, because if we really can understand prayer, we first need to understand why God created us and who we are in Him, because if we figure that out, everything else makes more sense. Everything else comes together. So that's what I was kind of thinking about. Let's talk about identity. As you can see, I'm going to be talking about this. Why did God create humanity? What was the purpose? Is it just for us to exist here, or is there something bigger? And I hope to kind of paint a, a picture this morning of why God created that created us. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along with me. I have a few of the scriptures on the screen here, but first one in Genesis. I think we all know this story, this account, probably one of the most well-known portions of scripture in the whole Bible. Well, let's read it. Then God said, let us. Did you ever stop and look at that and wonder what does that mean? <laughs> The us part, God saying let us. I'm not even going to get into that. That's a rabbit hole. I'm not getting down, but that's just something for you to think about. Maybe I'll do a class about that sometime. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now that word image, created in God's image, what does that mean? I want to look at a few other um, passages in Genesis where this word image comes up. In Genesis chapter 5, this is what it says, starting at verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So we have similar language here to, to the original creation account. Now this is, of course, after the fall. Right, so what we can take from that is it's, it's, the writer is deliberately painting an allusion back to the Genesis creation account with this language here of Adam fathering Seth. So what we can see is that this shows that the thing that made Adam special is still being passed on after the fall. So clearly, we don't lose the image after the fall, but clearly something happened. All right, and one more. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall shed his blood be shed, for God made man in his image. So there's something very serious to God about taking the life of another innocent human. It's almost as if it's an assault on God himself. So these are three passages in Genesis in this narrative that talks about the image, the image, the image. What does it mean exactly? And, you know, especially, I think, in this culture that we live in, when there's such an assault on identity, on what constitutes life, the abortion debate, transgenderism, everything stems from this. What does it mean for humans to be created in the image of God? And I think this is so pertinent to so many avenues in our lives today. I mean, just think about the abortion debate. What is life? Does it happen at conception? Is it a certain number of weeks? I mean, these are important things we need to understand. So... 
Oh, I didn't, I forgot I put those on the screen. Those are just those verses again. Um, so let's look at some general observations from these verses. Number one, both men and women are included in image bearing. The image is that which makes mankind distinct from the rest of the Genesis creation. There is something about the image that makes mankind like God in some way. Since God is a person, those who image him share in his personhood. And I, I, I'm borrowing this from a Bible scholar I really like because it was so good. Um, Michael Heiser, he does, he does this presentation. He actually used to teach some college classes on apologetics and ethics. And he said he would love when he get to the, the pro-life part. And I'll, I'll show you in a moment. But he said he used to love tormenting the, the freshmen over their ideas of what life is. But I thought it was really good, so I want to share it with you. There is nothing in the text to suggest that the image has been or can be bestowed incrementally or partially. You're either created in God's image or you aren't. One can't speak of being partly or potentially created in God's image. And the bearing of children in some way mimics or relates to the initial creation of mankind in the image of God. So, to figure out what the image is, what do we need to say about it to understand what it means? So first, it must make humankind distinguishably and certifiably unique in relation to any created thing that makes the physical universe its home. Every member of the human race must possess this image equally and to the same extent, and the image must be something shared with God's own being and nature. God created a lot of other things in that account sides for humanity. So, but humanity was the only thing that was made in God's image, which makes us completely distinct and unique. So what the image of God is not. The image of God is not intelligence, rationality, emotions, the ability to know God or commune with him, the possession of a soul, a free will, a conscience, sense of morality, the ability to communicate. And you might be thinking, well, what else is there? Well, let's look at a few of those. Intelligence, rationality, emotions. I mean, that's, that's humanity, right? To know and commune God, commune with him. Well, how about a baby at conception? Can they do any of those things? No. No, they can't. Or how about somebody who's in a coma? Are they doing those things? Not necessarily. Or even the possession of a soul, quote unquote. If you look at the Hebrew in the Genesis account, some of the animals say they have the same, the nefesh, it's the same word. I'm not going to get into that whole thing because there's a lot of, do animals have souls? Will they go to heaven? I don't know. That's not the purpose of this. A conscience, a sense of morality, the ability to communicate. Again, there's babies developing in the womb clearly can't do that. People who have accidents, who are paralyzed or, or whatever, can't do that. So again, if we're looking at the image, it has to be consistent that every human being must have that, no matter what. Well, then what is it? Because that seems like a pretty exhaustive list of humanity's unique qualities, doesn't it? Bless you. So I'm going to present that the key is actually in understanding the Hebrew word for image and also in thinking of the image as a verb. The image is a status. And I'm going to say that a key to this is how we take the preposition in. It might seem like an insignificant thing. God created man in his image. Well, let's do a little exercise on some language. If I say, put the dishes in the sink, I'm denoting location. How about, I wrote in pencil, denoting instrumentality. He broke the vase in pieces, result. Here's what to say in reply. Purpose or, function, purpose or process, I work in accounting. 
Now here's the one I want to focus on. That denotes function or capacity. Viewing the image in a functional sense, as if we are created to image God, as opposed to the qualitative sense, as though the image is something possessed, a possessed attribute or quality. So we should understand Genesis 1, 26 through 27 as meaning humankind was created to function in the capacity of the image of God. And if you look at the Hebrew words, there a legitimate way you can actually translate the passage is God created man as his image. That preposition in can mean as to in Hebrew. Think about that for a second. I know we like, this is again, a very well-known verse we are created as God's image. It's a status. You can't take it away. It doesn't matter if you're a developing baby in the womb, someone in a coma, whatever. That human is life. If they're at conception, that's life. What kind of life? It's human life. That's the image of God. Every person shares that no matter what their, you know, status in life is. Developing, sick, paralyzed, doesn't matter. The image of God. So let me, let's look at the Hebrew word too, because this is very interesting, I think. Now the Hebrew word for image is selim. It actually means a statue, an inscribed column, or an idol. Ooh. That, does that make you uncomfortable? So outside of the passages that we looked at in Genesis, the predominant use of this word is in reference to idols of foreign gods. Same word. I'm going to show you a few passages. In Numbers 33... Verse 52, it says, Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their metal, metal images, there's that word, and demolish all their high places. In 2 Kings chapter 11, in verse 18, it says, Then all the people of the land went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images, they broke into pieces. Here's one more in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 20. His beautiful ornament they used for pride, and they made their abominable images and their detestable things of it. So it's that same word that in these passages that I just read are describing idols of foreign gods, of Baal. That's the same word in the Genesis account that God uses for us as created in his image. So, based on what we've seen and looked at, we can think of being created in God's image as a status. Of being God's representatives here on earth. You could almost say that we are God's living statues. When those that don't know him yet see us, we are to point them to worship the one true God. Amen. Think about that. We are God's living statues. I mean, think of what an idol was to do, that someone would go into their temple and look at the idol as a representative of their God, and then they know that that's not actually the God, right? They understand that. Now, they did perform all sorts of different ceremonies that they would do to make the deity come into the idol. But they, did, they knew that that idol was just wood or stone or whatever, but it was pointing up to whatever they saw their deity as. God didn't do that. He created us <laughs> as his image. If you notice in the scripture, you look at the temple, is there any kind of statue of God? Any representative of him? No. Nope. No, there isn't. God did this on purpose. I want to share a few quotes with you that I found that I really liked. Oh, before I get there, forgot I put this in. Um, so just to show you some examples of what 
images looked like back in ancient times. Um, this statue is of the Syrian king Hadid Iti from the 9th century BC. Um, is dedicated to Adad, which I guess is the same as Baal, the patron storm god of Syria, and described in precisely the language of Genesis 126. The statue of the king embodies and represents Adad's authority. So you can actually look this up and, and see exactly what the inscription reads as, but pretty much it's the same kind of language that this king was made in the image of their god, and that this king is a representative on earth of that god. So this is something that was very common in the culture and is actually quite helpful that we have um, oops, that we have available to us this kind of writing to see what their thinking was like back then. I know, sorry for the size. Um, there's just a few other ways idols functioned in the, in the ancient world. In ancient royal Egypt, Idology. The Pharaoh was called the image of Re, the sun deity. Pharaoh, Amose, was called the prince of Re, the child of Keb, his heir. And there's a couple other examples, but that's how some of the ancient kings saw themselves that they were the son of God or the image of God here on earth, his representative. So literally, they saw themselves as a stand in for God, their God, whoever they worshiped. So here's a couple quotes that I really like that I think bring some clarity to this. Genesis 1.26 can only be understood against the background of an ancient Yahweh statue. Humanity is regarded as the statue of God. The terms image and likeness are used as synonyms denoting a statue. Humans were thus created to be the living statues of the deity. There was no need of a divine image because humans represented Yahweh as a statue would have done. Isn't that cool? Think about that. Every other culture, every other religion of that time had their own deity that had a statue, an idol, something to go and look at and worship that they can point to, this is what our God looks like. Now our God, the one true God, he doesn't have a physical body. <laughs> He's a spirit. But he created earth, and he wanted to put his image on it as somebody to be representatives of him. So instead of having some physical stone or wood or something to go and worship before, we are the living statue, so to speak, and we don't have to go to something to worship. We worship God. Here's another one. To appreciate the full force of this image of God and humanity theology, we must have in mind the role of idols in ancient Near Eastern religion, where an idol is set up to be the real presence of the God. Because the God is really believed to inhabit the image, the image is the God, and its proper care and veneration guarantees the God's benefits and protection for the worshiping community. With this understanding of divine images assumed, Genesis 1 has a sharply focused theological anthropology. Humanity is to be the eyes, ears, mouth, being, and action of the creator God within his creation. This point gives the biblical prohibition of idolatry its strongest possible rationale. For humans to make an idol is foolish because it fails to appreciate that according to the original order of creation, it is humanity that functions in relation to God, as do the idols in relation to their gods. Remember, that was one of the commandments that God gave to his people. You shall make no graven image. Why was that so serious? Because they were the image. You don't need to make an image of something else. You are the image. You are to be that to those that don't know me, to point back to me. Listen to what N.T. Wright says. God makes heaven and earth as a temple. He puts into this temple an image of himself so that creation all around can appropriately worship him through that image. So that the power, love, stewardship, and sovereignty of God can be exercised in the world through his image. Th think about this. God creates the Garden of Eden. Think of this as a temple because God dwelt there. And he placed humanity 
right there in the middle, to be his representatives, to steward it, to expand it, to expand his temple, so to speak, over the entire earth. That was God's original design, original idea. He hasn't deviated from that. But I love that kind of idea, that God makes heaven and earth as his temple. And we are put here to be his representatives. That's why if you look through the scripture, especially in the Old Testament, you know what the number one issue is? Idolatry. Of human beings deviating from that, from leaving their role as image bearers of God and worshiping other things. It's idolatry. So Genesis um, 128. Because God told them to do something else after he created them in his image. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves. So God gave humanity a job to do. I want to read um, Psalm 8. This is a kind of a, a commentary on that account. Psalm 8, starting at verse 5. Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. So God created humanity with a job to do, to be his representatives in the world around, to go from the garden, to subdue it, to multiply, to increase his rule and his reign over the entire earth. Amen. However, we know what happens. <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 4, but the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What's the irony in that? They already were like God. God made them like him. And Satan came and said, no, you're not. You need, you need this to be like him. And Eve ate of the fruit, and Adam ate of the fruit, and we know what happened. So what happened at the fall is that it caused humanity to look to themselves and put their needs and desires first. Instead of reflecting up to God, they reflected inwards. After the fall, we see man chasing their own desires, and all sorts of evil came from that. However, despite the fall, we don't lose the image. We saw that. We saw that with, with Adam and Seth. The, the language that is used there is intentional to bring us back to the original account. And in Genesis 9, that God still holds such a, a serious penalty for taking the life of an innocent image bearer. So we didn't lose the image, but something happened. Something happened in the fall. Sin entered in. And what did that do? So remember, if we see the image as a status, it's something that can't be taken away. If you are human, you're a God's representative on this planet, period. That is the definition of being human. So I think of it this way. At the fall, we didn't lose the image, but we lost the glory of the image. You know, remember in Psalm 8, it said that we were crowned with glory. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod. It carries with it the meaning of heaviness, burden, riches, reputation, importance, splendor, distinction. That sounds like how I would describe God. <laughs> 
the New Testament word for glory is doxa. It essentially means the same thing. And Pastor Jim has mentioned this many times, but doxa can also mean opinion. That word also has that definition. It's not really used like that in the New Testament, but it can mean that. So because of the fall, we allowed ourselves to be elevated and honored above God. Think of it like this. We let our opinion come before God's opinion. That was a temptation for Adam and Eve. Eat this and you'll think like God. You'll be like him. You'll be able to discern good and evil. They were already like God. But that was the trap to get them to look inward, to rely on themselves. And we see that in the, in the count. How, fall, how fast did humanity fall after that? You know, it goes right to, to Cain and Abel <laughs> with murder. And then it spirals and spirals and spirals because man started chasing after their own desires. They thought, we can do it better. The Tower of Babel. <laughs> Listen to what Paul says. And I think this really beautifully kind of paints this picture of what happens when humanity stops becoming the image of God and chasing after other images. In Romans chapter 1, starting at verse 22, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God Listen to this, for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Isn't that interesting that they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling themselves, birds, animals, creeping things? What was the, the mandate in Genesis 1.28? Take dominion over <laughs> creation. Now we see Paul's talking about what happens when humanity looks to the creation and worships the creation rather than the creator. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. It's quite the list. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And, and this is Paul so eloquently putting the downward spiral of what happens when we stop being the image of God, when we stop looking to God, and we start worshiping other things. Humanity was made for worship. Pure and simple. If you're not worshiping God... You're worshiping something else. And we have still have plenty of idolatry in our days, folks. <laughs> it may not look like a temple with a statue in it, but there's lots of other things that get our hearts and attention in our worship. Look at our culture. <laughs> I think this verse in Romans perfectly describes the state of our culture right now and how it's happened. People have taken their eyes off of God and onto themselves. And when that happens, they 
not God. They exchange the image for something else. And then God just says, if that's what you want, you have free will, you can have that. <laughs> but it's going to be a downward spiral. And we see that clearly in our culture. So because of what sin did to humanity, God chose for himself a people, a family in which he would redeem all the people through. He chose Abraham, right? He called Abraham out of a land, out of a culture that was steeped in idolatry. Abraham practiced all of these things. And God calls him, Abraham, I'm going to choose you to start a people. Because God is all about family. And it would be started through one, one man. But God's family would be different. A kingdom of priests. He gave them laws and guidance on how they should live before other peoples to point them to the one true living God. So God gave Israel all of these laws and commandments and covenants so that they would be different, that they would be righteous and set apart before every other people. That every other people would look to them and say, why do those weird Israelites live like that? Their clothing, the way they eat, the way they worship, everything. God wanted them to be different. And when every other culture was worshiping their gods, right? They go into their temple. They have their idol. Again, God didn't do that for his people. He set up the tabernacle and what was in it? They had the ark, right? They had the mercy seat where God's presence dwelled. But then who went in there? The high priest, you could almost see that as functioning as here comes the living statue coming in to the temple to worship God, not to worship something else. So it's really quite amazing how God, in the culture, in the context in which he came in, where people were doing all these different things, God said, my people are going to be different. They don't need to worship an image. God didn't give them an image of himself to look at. He said, look around you. You all are the image. You all represent a unique aspect of me. But at the fall, human beings started turning that inward and worshiped themselves and other things and not God. I want to show um, a picture of this, of being the image in Daniel. I'm probably just going to skip around a bit in the story, but I just want to point out a few things. Right at the beginning of the story, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Judah or to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave the king of Judah into his hand and some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in his treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of, or of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. Now, it's interesting that um, the word for royal family is actually seed in Hebrew. And do you remember what happened at the fall? That God said he would put enmity between Eve's seed and the serpent's seed. So here's a picture when evil's coming into Jerusalem. 
they plucked from there some of God's seed and are taking it back with them into Babylon. And that was, Daniel was one of those people. Now, remember the story. The king's eunuch says to them, we want to train you. We want to, you know, do all these things. You're going to eat like the king eats. So here's this choice. There's food before them. Forbidden food for a Jew, right? And what does Daniel do? Rejects it. No, we're, we can't eat that. We're not going to eat that. How about this? You feed us vegetables, and we'll show you that we'll be fine. And guess what? They were even better than the rest. But this is kind of like a commentary on that Genesis account of Adam and Eve. Here's a choice. Forbidden food. But Adam and Eve chose to eat that. And Daniel and his friends are saying, no. We're going to show you how to walk out being the image of God. And they rejected that. Right? So the story goes on. You know, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream about this, this giant um, statue. And it's actually the word image. He has a dream about a, an image. It's, now, this is in Aramaic, but the word image there is a sister word to the Hebrew word. So it's the same idea here. So he has this dream. Daniel comes and interprets it, tells him what it means. And then Nebuchadnezzar decides, you know what? That sounds like a good idea. I'm going to just go ahead and build it anyway. So Nebuchadnezzar makes this huge image of who? Himself. And tells everybody, come bow down, worship it. And we know what happened, right? He tells everybody to come out, bow down before my image. And everybody did except Daniel and his friends. And they defied it. They said, we're not going to bow down to an image. We are the image. They knew who they were. So the king was furious. Obviously, we know this story. I'm sure we all remember this from Bible uh, Sunday school and through the years. But the king throws them in the furnace, expecting them to be burnt up. But they don't. And there was another in the fire, like that song, that preserved them, the angel of the Lord. And they come out unscathed, don't even smell like smoke. Let me just back up for a moment. When Nebuchadnezzar had that dream and Daniel came to interpret it, listen to what happens, what Nebuchadnezzar does. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Isn't it interesting that Nebuchadnezzar bowed down before Daniel and recognized through Daniel that his God was the God? Why? Daniel is the image. <laughs> Now, I'm not saying what Nebuchadnezzar did was right to bow down before a human, but you get what I'm trying to say. That he recognized in Daniel the role that Daniel was playing. That Daniel was functioning how God created human beings to function. To be his image, to be his representative, even to a pagan king who himself he saw as a god. <laughs> and he's recognizing that. Daniel's God is God. Although I don't think he really paid attention to his own advice because then he goes and 
builds that statue and <laughs> calls everyone to worship him. Right. But it is so interesting. that Daniel and his friends are doing what God told them to do in a foreign land with pressure, with the threat of death, that they were so confident in who they were and why God made them that they rejected what man set before them. And they said yes to what God created them to do, even to the point of death. That they would go into the furnace and be delivered through God. And what eventually happens to Nebuchadnezzar? Remember he He's out one night thinking about how wonderful he is. <laughs> and what does God do to him? Humbles him, drives him out, and makes him like a beast, crawling on his hands and knees and eating grass. So God says, you want to worship that? You become that. You become like what you worship. And Nebuchadnezzar experienced that firsthand. And God eventually restored him. But it's like that thing that Paul talked about. You exchange the glory of God for images made of man or animals, and it's a spiral down. It's a clear example with Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel has lots of different visions. <clears throat> In one of the visions, just want to read it. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. So Daniel is seeing the true image, a picture of Jesus. It's kind of, it sounds like Revelation, doesn't it? But in this book, you have this dichotomy going on of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, of true image, false image. We have Nebuchadnezzar setting up a image of himself, people to worship. And then Daniel in his vision sees the true image, the perfect one. And he comes in fire. And Nebuchadnezzar thought he could destroy God's image with fire. And it didn't work because that one that Daniel saw showed up in the furnace and delivered them. And then Daniel seeing this vision of the one true image, the perfect image coming. And it's like no matter what man can do, no matter how great man thinks he is, God is always better. God is stronger. So, I read that just to kind of show you that there are examples in the Bible of humanity walking that out, of being the image. But there's also a lot of examples where they weren't. More so that, Look at the history of the Old Testament. Why do you think Jerusalem ended up in Babylon? <laughs> because they kept following other images, because they kept turning to idolatry, where God finally said, that's enough. 
You guys need to understand this. So we see lots of examples of the consequences of idolatry. We see a bright spot with Daniel that humanity can walk that out. But with sin and the fall, it's very difficult. It's difficult. It's hard to be the image, right? So because of sin in a fallen world, we need assistance to properly image God with the help of the Spirit. Now this is where Jesus comes in. The final piece in God's redemptive plan. Jesus came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill it. In other words, Jesus, as the perfect and true image, came to show us how to walk out God's opinions, to get the glory of the image back. That's why Jesus came and he said, I haven't come to abolish, but to fulfill. That means he came to show them this is how humanity walks out being the image of God. God didn't just tell them all these rules and regulations just because he felt like it. It was so they would be different and set apart. And Jesus came in to say, I'm going to be your example of how to do that. And now with my help, with the help of the Spirit, you can do that. Because before, when sin entered into the world, we couldn't properly do that. We can't do that without the help of the Spirit. We can't. We can't properly image God, but with that, we can. In John 14, Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's true. Jesus was the exact image of the Father. And he only did what the Father said, and he followed him to show us, to be an example. I'm going to share a few scriptures. In Romans 8.29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Conformed to the image of Jesus. Second Corinthians 3.18 And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So we, we are being transformed into the image of Jesus because Jesus is the image perfected. Colossians 1.15 He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the image. Colossians 3 5, or I'm sorry, 3 10. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So Jesus allows us to be renewed that we are being conformed to whose image? His image. Jesus bridged that gap for us where we could get back to being the image as God designed us to be. Jesus came and was the perfect one, blameless, without sin. So when Jesus died, it was as if the image of God was on that cross. God died for us so that we could have that relationship restored. That that chasm could be crossed once again. Where we could get back to Eden. That is the plan and it always will be the plan. You know, sin didn't enter and the fall didn't happen and God said, oh man... My plan's ruined. I have to go for the plan B. No. That's still his plan. That the glory of the Lord covers the earth as the waters cover the sea. Hallelujah. How does that happen? Us. 
being the image. That is the narrative of scripture, is back to Eden. The whole story is that. It starts with that and it ends with that. On earth as it is in heaven. There's a reason Jesus taught us to pray like that. (laughs) And someday that will become reality. That the earth will look like heaven. It doesn't fully look like that right now. But if we're properly doing our jobs as God created us to do, we can get closer and closer to that. So until then, though, we who are followers of Jesus must be conformed to his image and be the representatives that God created us to be in this broken world. Our job is to show people what God is like. Imaging is ultimately discipleship. We fulfill our roles as human beings when we become like Jesus. We image God when we imitate Jesus. That's how we get back to it. Jesus gave the example. He is the perfect one, and we are to emulate our lives according to him. And with his spirit, we can do that because he lives within us. So every human being has the same job. It might look a little different, for each person is called to something a little different. But each one of us, regardless of our situations, are the image of God. And God created us as his image, to be his image. As that quote said, his eyes, his ears, his mouth, his feet, in this world. Just as God created heavenly beings to do work in the heavenly realms, he created man to do his work on earth, in this physical realm. What a a joy and a blessing that we, each and every one of us, get to do that. We get to show people who don't know him what he is like, his character, his nature. When we become more like Jesus, we look more like God. When other people look at us, we point them to the creator. Jesus made the way. That's why he came as a man. To show us this is why God created you. And that's why discipleship is so important. I keep going back to that. We must understand this. That is God's plan. Be fruitful and multiply, not just in the physical sense, but multiply God's rule and reign throughout the earth. Bring people who don't know God yet into the kingdom. So when you're in your workplace, you're the image of God. (laughs) When people see you, the way you act, the way you talk, the way you carry yourself, They should be like, wow, you're so different. How can you be so hopeful, joyful with whatever everything else that's going around? What is that? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why I can have hope. Why I can have joy. God is hopeful. God is joyful. God isn't afraid. So we can confidently walk through this life knowing who we are and that we don't have to be swayed by what's happening in the natural. Because we are representatives of the creator. Think about how profound that is. God didn't just create humanity on a whim 
Like, oh, I think I'll make these living things to be in my world so I can look down from my throne and, and watch them. He created us to be his representatives here, to be his ambassadors here, to do his work in the physical world. Think about that. God created us to do his work with us. He, he can do anything and everything himself. He doesn't need us. He doesn't. He's God. He chose us. Each and every one of you. God knows you. He chose you. May we all understand the importance of who we are and never let the enemy lie to us and tell us, you don't have what it takes. I know your past. You, you're not capable of that. Those are all lies. Because Satan, still to this day, is trying to get us to exchange the image, exchange the glory of the Lord for something else. Maybe there's something in your life that you've put before God, something else that's got your time, your attention, and your worship. Or maybe you've had those thoughts of inadequacy that you think, I could never do that. I could never share the gospel with someone. I can't function properly how God would like me to. I can't, I can't, I can't disqualify myself, disqualify myself. But God says, yes, you can. Because he doesn't make mistakes. He created you. He knit you together in your mother's womb. God gave you your passions and your desires and your personality and he placed you where you are in your sphere of influence. He knows what he's doing. So don't let any of the lies hold you back from being God's representative wherever he's placed you. I think if the church as a whole can get back to putting a priority on becoming disciples of Jesus, looking more like Jesus and making disciples, we will see this world drastically change. But we get distracted with so many different things. There's so many distractions in this life of things that we're told are important, we're told are priorities, and don't get me wrong, there's other important things in life. But if your number one priority is not seek first the kingdom, of being a disciple of Jesus, and bringing other people into that discipleship journey of being Jesus followers themselves, then our priorities are out of whack. The church needs to get back to that church needs to get back to knowing their word, knowing this book, knowing the story, knowing the teachings, knowing who Jesus is, and get back to showing others, to teaching others. That's why what, you know, Pastor Jim emphasizes it all the time. Each one, reach one, teach one. It's not just a fun slogan. This is our job. No matter how far along you are in your faith journey, whether you just became a Christian yesterday 
or you've been a believer for 50 years. We're all called to do that. We're all called to be the image of God because you're human. <laughs> you can't not be it. No one can take it away. You can't lose it. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, we can walk it out. So Father God, just take a moment to reflect on who you are, your goodness, your grace, your majesty, your glory. And how much you love us. That you didn't just create us for no reason. But you created us to work with you. To be your partners on this earth. To be a part of bringing about your kingdom wherever we go, to pray on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, I pray for every heart that's here right now that you would do a deep work in us, that you would solidify our identity in a world and at a time where identity is so under attack that we would be so confident that you created us. To be as your image here on this planet. That you have tasked us to bring about your kingdom. To show others who you are through our deeds, through our actions, through our words. Jesus, help us. Help us to be like you to be conformed to your image each and every day. Help us to represent your character well as we go out in wherever you have placed us, that we would see ourselves as that ambassador, as your hands and feet, May we never lose sight of that. May we keep that as our number one priority, to become more like you and to show others who don't know you yet who you are. So I just come against every lie that we may have believed, that we may have partnered with that says we can't do that. We'll never measure up. We'll never be enough. I can't because of this. I can't because of my past. May you break every lie that we have said yes to. And may we fix our eyes firmly on you. Jesus, may we lock eyes with you. the author and perfecter of our faith. And may we be your image to a broken world around us. In Jesus' name, amen.
if you're here this morning and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you the opportunity this morning or if you feel like you need to rededicate your life to him now is a really good time or if you need prayer for anything else I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward we want to pray with you we want to bless you and if not be blessed have a wonderful day and remember, you are the image of God. Amen? Amen. Amen.